Good evening, all. Welcome. My name is Dennis Torres. I'm the Associate Director of Veteran Support Services at CUNY Queens College. Welcome and thank you for tuning into our first ever virtual diversity and leadership event. Queens College is home to the, the home of over 224 student veterans, military personnel, family members. We recognize the human capital that our diverse student body brings to the local QC and greater New York City community. First, I'd like to thank the sponsors that made this event possible. The Office of Student Development and Leadership, Student Affairs, my colleagues within the Veterans Support Services Office, Queens College Veterans Club. Lastly, the leadership of New York City's Department of Veterans Services and City Council. Please feel free to use the comment section to add questions for the Q&A segment. Next, QC Veterans Club Vice President, Air Force Veteran Jasmine Morales has the honor of introducing our highly esteemed guest speaker. Jasmine, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. Um, I just wanna take this opportunity to, to let you know a little background inf information about um, our honored speaker, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Olga Custodio. Uh, so turned away from flight school because she was a woman. Olga Custodio went on to break barriers, including the sound barrier, as the first Latina to complete US Air Force military pilot training. First to become a U US Air Force pilot and later as the first Latina commercial pilot for American Airlines, she also holds first for all women as the first woman flight instructor at two major Air Force bases. Living by the mantra, querer es poder, which loosely translates to where there's a will, there's a way. Custodios, perseverance, fighting spirit, leadership abilities, and passion for flying took her to where few women have gone before. Now retired, she continues to lead and inspire championing STEM and motivating women and girls to pursue aviation and male dominated professions. Growing up all over the world in a military family, Custodio was inspired to follow in her father's footsteps and serve her country. In college, she wanted to enroll in a military training program, but they did not yet accept women. Instead, Custodio deferred her dreams, graduating from the University of Puerto Rico marrying and having a family. 10 years later, she finally had the opportunity to pursue her, pursue her dream. Uh, entering US Air Force undergraduate pilot training, UPT, and graduating in the top 5% of her class as the program's first Latina graduate and a graduate of officer training school. Custodium received her fighter pilot qualification and became the first female T-38 UPT flight instructor at Laughlin and Randolph Air Force bases. She was also awarded the Air Force uh, Headquarters Air Education and Training Command Aviation Safety Award for superior airmanship during an emergency engine failure due to a bird strike, during which she executed a safe heavyweight landing. In 1987, Custodium resigned uh, her Air Force, US Air Force regular commission entering the US Air Force Reserves. She was assigned to the headquarters uh, Air Force Personnel uh, Center, AFPC, and began a 20 year uh, career flying for American Airlines. Her career at American began as a flight engineer on the Boeing 727, quickly moving up to first officer. Within a short time, she flew the B-727 internationally. Custodio earned her Air Transport Pilot Certificate and became a Falker 100 captain a few years later. Her last five years with American was based in Miami, flying the Boeing 757 and 767 internationally to Europe and South America. Now retired from both American and the U.S. Air Force Reserves, Lieutenant Colonel Custodium is an active charter member at, of the Women Military Aviators Association a member of the Women in Aviation International and the Order of Dedalians. She is also an executive director, also executive director and treasurer of the Women in Aviation International Alamo City Chapter. Dedicated to attracting more women and young people to aviation and STEM careers, she is a mentor with the Aviation Explorers Organization in San Antonio and the School of Aeronautics in the Inter-American Inter University in Puerto Rico. She is also the Vice President of the Hispanic Association of Aviation and Aerospace Professionals. In 2017, she became the first Latina inducted into the San Antonio Air, uh, Aviation and Aerospace Hall of Fame. Custodium has been recognized twice by the Senate of Puerto Rico as an outstanding and exemplary citizen 
and the first and only Puerto Rican female pilot in the U.S. Air Force and American Airlines. Recently, she was featured in a commercial made by Modelo, Modelo Especial Beer as a part of their fl uh, Fighting Spirit advertising campaign. With her indomitable spirit, dedication to country and service, and commitment to inspiring the next generation, Olga has energized audiences around the country with her personal journey and professional accomplishments, sharing her belief that if you want something to happen, you have to go out and get it. She motivates all of us to become uh, to overcome obstacles and never stop believing in our dreams. So without further ado, thank you so much, Lieutenant Colonel Olga Custodio. Hi, and thank you. So I'll take questions. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> thank you so much. I mean, that that sounds like a lifetime and it was and it, it was it was a great, great adventure and journey for me. I uh, I'm very happy to be able to be here tonight or this afternoon and speak to fellow veterans and those of you who served our country. First and foremost, thank you all for your service. Um, I think if you know, we are a very small percentage of the U.S. citizen population that actually serves our country, and, and we should all be proud of that service. It's so important. Um, as a veteran, you know, having served in the military, I know transitions um, are hard sometimes, you know, especially when you are trying to find the next stage in your professional career, in your life, um, taking that next step, um, enrolling in college, you know, finishing a degree or continuing education towards uh, another degree. But um, the different stage or location or job, it, it, it takes a lot of effort and thought on transition. Um, the way I see it is you need to kind of visualize where you're going and how you're going to fit into this new environment. You know, you're used to one thing and, and stepping outside that comfort zone is sometimes things that, that make you uncomfortable, but it's a step that you, you have to take. Um, we all learn to deal with change and transition through our prior experiences, which help you grow as a person. And, and finding that determination, uh, persistence, resilience, whatever it takes to help build that confidence that you need to get through your challenges. So um, Jasmine, obviously, you know, gave you a big snapshot of what my professional career was, was like. And I always looked up to my father. He was my role model. He served our country. He was at the very last part of World War II and served in the Korean War and had a 23-year military career. And the good thing about that for me is that after I was born in San Juan, Puerto Rico, my mom and I stayed there for about three months, and then we went to join my father. So for the most part, everywhere that he was stationed, um, we were able to be with him. So we weren't one of those military families where the, the father would get an assignment and he'd leave and the family would stay behind wherever that would be. The military member would serve their two year commitment at the new station and then come back and, and rejoin the family. Um, my father was really good at making sure that the whole family stayed together and we all traveled together, which gave me the experience of um, of being able to experience different places, you know, and I think that is a key component of who shaped me to to who I was, you know, and am today, because living in different countries. I lived in Taiwan, Iran, Paraguay, and South America, um, gave me an experience of different cultures, different people, their languages, their, their custom, customs, their beliefs and everything. But I, from that, I learned that with respect, 
we can all get along despite our differences. You know, you give respect to get respect. And that's one of the things that, that I learned growing up. The other thing I learned growing up is that, you know, the places I live, you know, not everybody, not that we could go there right now, but um, not everybody says, oh, I'm going to go on vacation or I'm going to be a tourist and I'm going to go to Taiwan or I'm going to go to Iran or, or Paris. You know, they're, they're not on your top 10 places to go vacation or visit as a tourist or a traveler. You know, and there's a difference between being a tourist and being a traveler. Um, travelers want to experience what the country is about or the city or wherever they go. So that's a true traveler. And being able to immerse yourself into a culture um, was an experience that at the time you're young, you're, it's, it's not what you envision for yourself. Um, very different to what you know it's happening in the U.S., you know, how kids are growing up and their schools and, you know, going to homecoming or this, that or the other, you know, I never experienced that. But what it did give me was a great perspective of of the world we live in and um, how how I can become a better world citizen. I am a U.S. citizen. I'm very proud of that, but also a world citizen. I represent my country everywhere I go, and I'm very conscious of that. So, you know, having been able to experience all that also gave me the experience of adapting, of being able to say, well, where I'm at right now is not going to be forever. And I know it's going to change. And, and you, you look for the hope to, it's going to get better. You know, there's going to be a change. So you, you make the best of what you have at the time, and then you move on. The other thing is going to new schools. Every time I had to go to new schools, make new friends, you know, it's like starting over and over and over. And one thing my husband and I, he grew up in Puerto Rico, that we that are very different for both of us, our experiences, is that he can go back and talk to his kindergarten friends that he there's he's still connected to them. You know, for me, I may have one or two people that that I could say that I could go back and remember this time or that time. And that would be just in high school, you know, when I experienced that. But other than that, you know, I I don't remember friends in kindergarten or middle school for that matter. So, so that's kind of what I lost, but it made me a stronger person, more confident. I had time to, to look within and see, you know, exactly what I needed to do to, to adapt to these different situations. So, you know, having tried to enter the ROTC, I was 16 years old. You know, my father retired. We went back to Puerto Rico. And what do you do at 16? I was, I'm like, I haven't even thought about what I'm going to do with, the, with myself for the rest of my life. But I did know one thing. I did know that I wanted to be in the military. And I did know I wanted the Air Force instead of the Army. Um, and my dad was okay with that. But what I did know is women weren't allowed. And be, being 16, so naive, you know, the commander says, I'm sorry, but you didn't pass the test and you're not qualified. And I'm like, yes, sir, thank you very much. And off I went. So I had to make a change of plans. You know, I was going to be a math major. I mean, that was my thing. Uh, I wanted to study math and I figured I can do math and, and become an officer in the Air Force and serve my country and follow in my father's footsteps. But then I had to go to plan B. And that's, something that I learned, okay, we adapt, we make the best of the situation and then find a new plan. So I went into business, you know, thinking accounting, yes, they're numbers, but it's not the same. And those of you that are studying accounting, forgive me, but, you know, numbers are numbers, but accounting is not math, you know, in some, in my mind, and, and in equations and that sort of thing, you know, there's so much more to, to accounting. Um, so my hat's off to all of you who are studying accounting. But um, waiting 10 years to get the opportunity to go into the military was what I think and describe and looking back is, you know, sometimes denial is just a delay because you're either not ready, you don't have the right experiences, 
Um, you just need more time to get prepared to when that opportunity comes up, you're ready for it, and you know that this is it. You know that this is my time and this is what I need to do to get there. So that's the way I saw that denial looking back. At the time, obviously, I'm, you know, heartbroken. I'm like, oh, my gosh, now what? So, so plan B goes to plan C to, you know, and I had to adapt. And I adapted, you know, and so um, I was married, three and a half year old daughter, and find out this opportunity that the Air Force is looking for female pilots. And it was like, this is the time, you know, I knew it was my moment to go out and, and give it everything I had, focus my energy on, on making sure that I did everything I could to make this happen. And I wasn't going to let any, anybody tell me that I wasn't qualified. And the reason is because I worked for the Department of Defense and I had access and I was a civilian employee in the Air Force. So I had access to all the regulations. So I researched all the tests I needed, all the minimum passing scores, medical exams, applications, timeline, everything. So I learned that knowledge and information is power. You, you know, if it's at your fingertips, you need to go out and find it and get it and use it. And, and know that the better informed you are, the more educated you are, the better off you're going to be, you know, and you, that way, when it's time to advocate for yourself, you have the tools. And you can't know everything. But the other thing is that you find people who can help you. You know, they're your mentors. There are people, and all you have to do is ask. You're, you, you can be very surprised of just by asking someone, hey, do you think you have a moment to help me with whatever it is? And people are willing to help. You know, people are willing. They're out there ready to help and mentor if you choose, you know, because if you sit back and say, oh, I'm going to mentor you, you don't know if that person needs your help or not. Everybody needs help. And, you know, I'm, I'm always learning, always learning. And, and what I don't know, I, I try and educate myself and go out there and find out the information. But it just helps you when you face those challenges, you know, um, and obstacles and people trying to throw those barriers in front of you to see, you know, if they can get rid of you or trip you or, or get you out of the program. And I had those, I had those. But um, I think the fact that that I could concentrate on my career, you know, already married with, with our family in, in place, sort of say. Um, my husband was very supportive and that's a good work-life balance that we had to figure out and he was willing to do that with me. So I thought that was an important part of the equation. Uh, my mother didn't want me to do it at all. I mean, she was totally against it. She was like, you're married, you have a job, what else do you want in life, you know, and, and she couldn't understand that. Not that, that she wasn't a um, forward thinking woman, because her mo mother was an entrepreneur, and she learned a lot from her mom. She knew that, you know, finances for women is really important. And a lot of women don't want to get involved in their finances, and they need to, you know, because, um, it, it, it just gives you that cushion, that safety net, that anything happens, you have money set aside. So she was all about that. But she figured, you know, me being married with a kid and, hey, you know, she did it. Why can't, couldn't I? But I, I wanted more. I wanted, I, I had another purpose and I could feel it. You know, I knew that. I knew it. And it was something that I always was working towards. But I think the biggest challenge everybody faces, everybody, is, is yourself. You know, you become your worst enemy because you put that doubt and that fear out there. And, and your, the, your fear of failure, your fear of, of the challenge itself, you know, and, and any change that comes with it. So, and, and I know that doubt always limits that potential that you, that you have. And everybody has potential. It's a matter of looking for it and, and, and working, you know, towards that potential. So I had a flight instructor um, at pilot training 
tell me right to my face. He said, you're not going to make it in this program. So, you know, I don't know why you're working, why you're here, or, you know, why you're, you're working so hard. And so, but to me, little did he know that, you know, he thought he was, he was making me doubt myself and, and get myself out of the program. But actually what he did was he kind of built the fire under me and it made me work harder and better and stronger. And, um, and I knew that I had to remind myself every day that, and stay very clear what my goal was. You know, I couldn't look at it as a whole. I had to take it one day at a time, one, one section at a time, because, you know, if you look at the, the enormity of, of what you're trying to achieve, it just becomes way too much, you know, so you had to break it down. Um, so I did. And, and, and it helped me understand who I was, what I was doing, and, and where I was going, you know, and gave me that confidence that I'm good, I'm supposed to be here. And this is what I'm working towards. Plus, I surrounded myself with, with people who were positive and encouraging, you know, sometimes, you know, I talk to younger groups that they just want to be in the crowd and be in and fit in. And, and, you know, sometimes that's not good because that sometimes people want to pull you down, you know, either because they're jealous or because they don't understand. And, and those are the people that you kind of want to step away from because you, you need to have positive people around you to help you, even though, the people that support you don't understand what you're trying to do. I finally got my mom on board, you know, so she was very supportive of what I was trying to achieve. And, you know, and after I graduated, she was a proud mom, you know, my daughter's a pilot and she was all proud about it, you know, but, but at least they, they were supportive and they got on board and, and helped me and, and the family, you know, make this happen. And then that work life balance that my husband and I had to figure out. The other thing is, I had no mentors. There were not any women in the program that I could go up to and say, well, how'd you navigate this, you know, area or how'd you do this? Or what, what about this situation? And so I had to figure it out on my own, how to navigate through this male dominated culture in pilot training, you know, being the only female there. Um, but I think what I saw in myself I projected that and I made sure that people knew that I, I was confident that I had to be there and I was giving it the best that I could. And I was very fortunate that a lot of my peers, you know, we were all working towards the same goal. So we kind of worked together. So it wasn't a competition or anything. It's like we all had to kind of come together in order to, to, to graduate, you know, you cooperate and you graduate. And, and I think that's really, really important. Um, but, you know, we were way out of the box. And those of you who are veterans understand that here I am a female officer in pilot training. My husband's enlisted uh, airman. He's enlisted. And we have our three and a half year old daughter. So the way he puts it, he says, we were like in a fishbowl, you know, everybody was looking at us to see what was going to happen. But on the other hand, it was like, they were trying to help us succeed. So we, we were, yes, we were in a fishbowl, but yes, you know, I mean, they made sure that everything was done right. And things were, were, fair across the board and I wasn't given any special privileges but then again I wasn't tried to be put in some other box to try and get me out of the program because it was a new program so it was them figuring out how women could fit into the military in this profession which was brand new so they were learning from me as I was learning about the Air Force and the program so it was a it was a dual commitment, I think, you know, for me to succeed and for them to have a female succeed. But again, you know, no special um, exemptions or anything. I, I worked as hard as everybody in my class. And, and when I got to T-38s, and I mean, that was my, my, that is my favorite aircraft of all time, you know, of all the aircraft that I flew, 
that was the best. Um, I did eight years active. It was time to move. Now it was my turn to take the family and go, okay, are we moving or are we staying and what's going on? My husband had gotten out. He had finished. He took advantage of his GI Bill, uh, finished his degree, got his master's degree, and he got a great job with the Department of Defense. And I said, well, I think the best thing is for the family to stay and I need to find a job that, that I can, can come and go. A lot of my peers were transitioning to the commercial airlines and I had to make sure that I was ready for that. I, again, um, found out everything that I needed to qualify to apply and I went ahead and got that organized. I had to go out and study for my flight engineer's license. And again, nobody around to help me and say, this is what I did. So I, I went out, figured it out, studied for the test, went to the FAA, applied, and I took my test, passed the test. So I got my radio uh, license. I got my flight engineer's license. I got my commercial airlines license and my medical license. And then I went and I applied for the airlines. So um, the process and the interview was long. Uh, uh, what I did planning, I saved up a year's salary so it would hold me over until I could actually get into a job. So I had a year's salary saved up, and that way there was no rush. You know, it was not no pressure on my husband having to make more money or me to find a whatever job. So I gave myself that time to study and prepare and and be comfortable. Um, and then you know, getting those licenses and applying, I went for the interview. And at American Airlines, it's a three-part interview. The first one is with HR, make sure all the paperwork's correct and all my licenses are valid. The second interview is a medical uh, interview and it's a full medical. I mean, they do psych tests and everything on you. It's a full day. And then the third interview is a flight simulator where I had to go in and prove on a 727, which I had never flown. They say, here's the approach. This is what you're going to do. Make sure I knew my instruments, how to fly. They, they had someone telling me, okay, here's the flap lever. Here's the gear level, you know, but that I had what it took to fly a 727. And I had the skills and the knowledge. And then I went into a room with five airline captains there at the time, all male, and interviewed with them. And they each had to ask the question, well, how do you feel about working with crews? And how do you feel about flying for a commercial airline? And how is that transition with the military to the commercial airline going to be? And, and I think the biggest thing for me, and it's something that, that I didn't know what it was, and there's a label for it, it's called emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence is to make sure that you put the facts out there, that you stay emotionally separated from what your personal feelings are and everything that, that you need to know and use to get over a, a, a situation and, and just spell it out like it is, you know. And, and if somebody pushes back or says something, not to take it personally, and I always look at what that person is trying to tell me or where they're coming from. And I learned that through my students, too. They were very challenging at the very beginning. I'm a female second lieutenant telling them how to fly, teaching them how to fly a T-38. And they'd look at me and like, are you sure? Like, do you know what you're talking about? And when they graduated, they were very thankful for me getting them through the program. But um, the hardest thing, I think, at American Airlines in that transition were the older captains. The older captains there were set in their ways. You know, they, they came from an era or decade or two that women were supposed to be at home and the men were supposed to be working. So they, they complained about um, the fact that I, I'm sorry, that I was there. Okay. Sorry. There we go. Anyway, um, they they complained about the fact that there were women in, in the flight deck. You know, they didn't understand why we were there. And um, so I just found it an, an opportunity to um, 
educate them, you know? Any opportunity I had with people who gave me pushback or or didn't understand why I was there and I had to justify, you know, why I was there, I said, well, okay, if you're willing to listen, I'm going to educate you. This is X, Y, and Z. This is how I got here. This is why I'm here. This is, I'm just as capable of you, you know, that was in the flight deck or or a passenger who would get on board and would say, oh, you're the captain of the flight. I go, yes, I am. And uh, I said, yes, I'm very capable. You know, I've gone through training. And if you're not comfortable with being on my flight, the next flight will probably leave in an hour or two and you can get off and, and take that flight if you don't want to fly with me. And and some of them would just kind of, oh, no, fine, you know, lower their head and, and walk to the back of the aircraft and get on board. And uh, luckily, nobody ever got off my flight. So I was good with there. Um, but um I, I had a great career, 20 years at American, you know, uh, my kids are nine years apart. I had our son towards the tail end of my active duty time. And um, they're all grown and on their own way, you know, they're, they, nobody took aviation. And uh, so I have to pass it on to somebody, right? <laughs> but, um, you know, being the first female in the military, one of very few, um, females and that American out of 5,000 pilots, there were only 28 of us at the time. So, you know, our percentage was less than 1% and it's been slowly climbing, but we're still working on that, you know, and being first was not a plan. My plan was to serve my country, be in the military and, um, and give service, you know, back to, to, like my father did, I guess. And, um, but I'm most proud of, of, of my family, my husband, we've been married for 46 years and the support that they have given me uh, during my career and what I still do now. Um, and I'm a big STEM advocate. I'm out in the community and I'm a mentor and, and do whatever I can to help the community and anyone, you know, out there around so and I do use the mantra querer es poder and Jasmine I have just changed that translation to where there's a will there is power because you know poder means more than just that so where there's a will there is power and um I I want to leave you this I I have a friend she she's a veteran she kind of rebranded herself and she just she has a new online course. It's called Branding Before Your Resume. And I haven't had a chance to look at it, but I know Graciela, she's, she's a go-getter. And I can share this with Jasmine and Dennis if y'all want to look into it. I think she's making it into a book. should be out in a week or two. But um, she knows what it means to transition. And she had to, she's an entrepreneur. And that was her her transition into from being a veteran into the uh, commercial world. So, but um, just one last thing, and I, it's a quote, and I'm just going to kind of paraphrase it. It says, if you do the same thing all the time, you'll get the same results. But if you want to dream and achieve something you've never had, you have to do something you've never done. When you change your thinking, you change your actions, and then you will get different results. So thank you very much. And sorry, I took a few minutes more. And uh, but I'm so happy to be here for you guys. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Um, it was very, very touching. Um, there were definitely some parts in there that I was like, wow, this is amazing. Like, And I could definitely relate in so many different ways. And I think that um, actually our audience, too, um, had a lot of points uh, throughout your speech that that they could relate to. And so there were so many questions that came in and I actually wanna bring up a few of them. Um, so the first story or the first question, this comes from Danielle. And um, she said, your story is so amazing. Uh, she said, was there a moment where you thought you couldn't complete the program? And she said, if right. so, how did you overcome so those feelings? I'm, I'm asked that question a lot, you know, and that's where I look back and reflect on denial is just a delay. And I think the fact that 
I was pushed away twice. And when I finally got my opportunity, to me, failure was not an option. And so I had to make sure I gave it 100%. And, and I worked through those challenges and the barriers. It's like, you know, doubt and fear, fear of failure, fear of change. Yes. But you can, you can overcome that. You're stronger than you think you are. You're stronger than you think you are. And yes, everybody has that doubt. Every other night, oh God, this is too hard. And, but just push through, you know? It, it's like that fake it until you make it. I don't know what kind of thing it's a phrase, something like that. So, so you're like, okay, I'm good. And, and let's keep going. And, you know, if I fall on my face, so I'll fall on my face, but here I am, you know? And, and you keep pushing through and then you'll surprise yourself. So surprise yourself on how strong and resilient you are. So, yeah, we all have those doubts, but you no, know, you just push through them. So. Yes, I can definitely agree with you. Um, I, I've been in some of those moments many times, and I there was something that you said that made me think: mindset is everything. So how your mind is, that's the way that everything's gonna, you know, it's gonna fall. And so when you have that that strong mindset and a positive mindset, then then absolutely. truly you can really accomplish anything. So, um, so absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wanted to. So a lot of times with the veterans, uh, we tend to swap stories. You know, we we think about you know, all the things that, you know, we went through, especially active duty and and just being in the reserves and everything. And it's 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 a fun time, you know. And so I really want to know um, what is the most memorable moment that you had in your military career? Wow. So many, <laughs> so many, but I think getting my wings pinned on that sense of accomplishment that I made it through this program. And not only did I make it, but I was in the top percent of my class. You know, I, I proved to myself that I had it within me to get this and achieve it. And, and then to look around and see my husband and family and everybody there and friends that we made through the way. Because, you know, I always say it takes a village, you know, if it weren't for friends who came in and helped out, you know, at moments that we, we needed help, especially with our, our daughter. Um, so, yes, and, and people come in, in and out of your life for different reasons. And, and I totally understand that and appreciate them. But just getting those wings pinned on and achieving that was was huge for me you know really big and when i went through the flight screening and officer training school um the cutoff for flight training was 26 and a half and i was already 26 so i had to make sure that there weren't any setbacks in those two programs so i could actually start before i hit the cutoff and not have to ask for a waiver or anything to get in. So I, I made the cutoff. But the, I think that was one of the most memorable moments for me um, in the military, you know. And, and then the day I retired, you know, when they hand you the flag and you go through that ceremony and, and it's like, I did it, you know. I achieved my goal of what I set out to do. And that's one thing that when I went to commercial flying, I made sure that my purpose was to serve and I had to continue to serve because I had to finish what I started. So, you know, having two jobs, that's, that's okay. That's okay. And a family and, and my husband and, and all this, but you can do it. You know, it, nothing, you can work through it. So yeah, takes work, but if everything was easy, we'd all be great. You know, we'd all be doing everything and anything we wanted to. And, but you appreciate it more when you work harder towards it. And you make sure that you work to keep it too, because if somebody gives it to you, you can say, "Oh well, this, I'm over this and toss it out." So, you know, working hard to achieve something is something that people appreciate and 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 work harder to keep it, maintain it, and then continue forward. So, sorry about the long answer, but yeah. No, I can definitely appreciate that. I, I I can imagine that must have been a very beautiful moment. And then to see your whole support system, you know, cheering you on. Oh, wow. It's very beautiful. Yep. Very, very Absolutely. beautiful. Um, and 
you know, I was looking, <clears throat> so I have to admit, I was pouring through different interviews and, and things like that about you um, beforehand and, uh, well, you know, previously. And I saw that one in, in one of the interviews that you did, you actually said that you didn't know, right, that you were the first and the first Latina pilot, right? And so I, I looked at that and I said, wow, she didn't even know. But then my, my thought is like, you know, you said that when you got your first student and that's when you found out. And so how did you feel in that moment? And then and then to know, especially that, you know, people like me and, and so many others, right? We're right. Looking, looking up to you, you know? Right. Like, how does that make you? Well, I, I guess the fact that um, growing up in the military and, you know, everybody, to me, we, we're all part of this military family, right? And I didn't see myself different from anybody else. To me, you know, yes, I'm Puerto Rican. I have my uh, Hispanic heritage and I'm proud, which I learned to embrace after the fact because uh, I didn't grow up in Puerto Rico. But I made it a point to embrace my heritage and learn about it and, and, and all of that and teach it to my kids. Um, we have our own identity. But in, in the broad scheme of things, you know, we're, we're all the same the way I see I see myself the same as you or anybody else you know um so I didn't see myself as a female Latina in this male dumb yeah I knew it was all male dominated but my god I had the opportunity here I was um and then I get my first female student who had graduated from the Air Force Academy she was uh from Arizona Arizona or New Mexico and She's the one that told me, she says, oh, I'm going to be the first Latina pilot for the Air Force. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, <laughs> I'm a Latina. I'm already a pilot. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry, but I think you're looking at her. She's right here <laughs> in front of you. And she was like, what? I go, yep. So she didn't even know. And so it's something that just caught me by surprise. You know, I knew I was the first female instructor at the squadron, but I didn't know I was the first Latina. I didn't know that was even a thing. And and the same thing at American Airlines. You know, I'm already an FE flying for American, and we get a new female FE come in that got hired by American, and she goes, oh, I'm going to be the first Latina female pilot for American. And again, it's like, hello? <laughs> So it wasn't it wasn't a thing for me. It was like, oh, I found out after the fact. It wasn't like a goal. I want to be the first. No, it's like I'm following my vision, my dream. This is my goal and this is what I want to pursue. And here I am, you know, it just happened to be the first. And I know I was the first because I what I say, I, I had to make my own path and hopefully left a trail for others to follow. Because, you know, I mean, when there's nothing to guide you, you're like, okay, I think this, this is a good way to go, you know, and then you make your changes and, and go. But yeah, that to me, it wasn't a, a thing. First Latina is like, wow. But, but I embrace that. I'm proud of it. And because I had such a great career, I make it a point to let people know because there's so many women and it doesn't matter what field you're in, that are trying to achieve things, and even males, you know, Hispanic, minorities, you know, whatever you want, underserved, that they can see someone who has made it. And, and I put myself out there, and I love to mentor and, and speak to anyone who wants to listen that it can be done. And this is, this is how I did it. This, this is what I needed to do and how I kind of navigated those barriers and, and, and found that resiliency, you know, so, but everybody has that within them. And I, and I need to share that. So. No, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, we actually have another question too, uh, that was, we're speaking about, you know, first, uh, first Latina woman pilot, you know, um, and so Kate O'Brien actually asked, well, she said, thank you. First of all, for sharing your incredible story, right? Um, she said, uh, you're an inspiration to so many women, which is very true. Um, and she actually asked, were there women that you looked up to when you were beginning your career? 
Um, I tried to to find uh, women that I could say, you know, so I think there was no one. I didn't have a mentor. There weren't women that I could say I looked up to them. And so, yeah, it was, it was hard. It was very hard, you know. And so I have to say, you know, my, my mom's strength on, on, and, and then my grandmother, she was an entrepreneur, um, and how she handled and managed eight kids um in her her business so just looking back at them I, in those times I, I was like wow but but I think it was maybe part of my DNA too you know I had that within me and uh and I would look I would look for women who who were more higher ranking to see how they they kind of acted and did and what their job was and and so I tried to take a little bit from everybody that I saw, every female, especially in the military. And then in American Airlines, um, we, we didn't see each other at all. I think when I retired is when I finally at operations, that's where we would get ready for the flight plan and everything, that I would run into a couple of females. And that, those were my happy moments when I found another female pilot, whether it be military or commercial, and I say, hey, do you have a minute? And we sit down and talk, and where do you live, and how do you do it? You know, I was trying to try to encapsulate and, and find out everything I could about them in five minutes, you know, because that's all the time we had, because we all lived in different places. We all had our lives, and, and you know, for women, we, we have a lot on our plate, a lot on our plate. and. Um, so I, I took from every female that I saw as a strong role model leader, you know, I took the best of each one of them and, and kind of grabbed from there. But I didn't have one exactly that says, okay, I'm going to be just like her or do follow her path or because I had my own, you know, my situation was different than anybody else's. No, I can definitely understand that. And usually it's it's mom and grandma who are like the strongest women in our lives. But um, of course. <laughs> but, um, but so we have another question, too, that uh, I think is really good uh, because it's definitely uh, an advice aspect. So uh, this comes from Ramandeep. So forgive me if I uh, if I said your name correctly. However, um, the question is, what advice would you give to someone who wants to be a fighter pilot after college? Um, and like what to study, how to prepare yourself and how to be like the selection process, I'm assuming is, is pretty stringent, but uh, how to, to basically um, look better qualification wise. Right. So I, I would recommend, and I mean, first of all, you have to take some flight lessons to make sure that you're comfortable behind a yoke or a stick or whatever you fly, you know, that you you have the aptitude um, to learn how to fly. So that's that's the first thing I would recommend because I would tell my students, you know, you can have 20 to 30 percent talent and skills. 80 to 90 percent is motivation, you know. I mean, if you have the skills, we can we can work with that. We, and, and I would take care of the weaker students, but, but you need to go out and at least take some flying lessons or they have orientation flights that you can do and um, get your four-year degree and, and study for your AFOQT. And I know after that test, there's another test to make sure that you have the aptitude to become a pilot in the Air Force. So those are the tests that you need to study and prepare yourself to make sure that when the time comes, you're, you're ready. No, yeah, absolutely. I think uh, um, uh, that's like the same kind of advice, I think, for, for any career or anything that you'd be shooting for. Right. That makes sense, absolutely. Um, I do have uh, 
Uh, one last question, I think it's kind of a hefty question. And, and to be honest, I think that many, many veterans, we all ask each other this, or okay. we all wonder this. Um, and uh, and, and I, I see several people have uh, kind of asked the same question in, in different words, but um, a lot of people struggle. A lot of veterans have a hard time um, struggling with transitioning out of the military and uh, over into the civilian life. And um, and it, it's something really, really, you know, uh, uh, hard to deal with and very touching in some some people's uh, stories. So I, I really would love to know. We really love to know how was your transition out? What kind of advice would you have for today's veterans who are transitioning into that civilian world? And then and then what what how was your civilian life like? How was it different? Like, OK, well, obviously, in the military, they tell you. What to do? where to go, what time, and you have specific tasks, okay? In the, in the civilian world, you're on your own. They say, this is the goal, and you better meet the standards. You need to figure out where to go, what to do, what time to get there. You are responsible for you. In the military, it was very different, okay? So that's, the, to me, the biggest change and transition that people coming out of the military need to understand that when you're asked to do something it's your responsibility you need to figure it out and make sure you achieve that task or goal or whatever is asked of you um the other thing i think is is really big is that you need to find that skill set that you had in the military and see how it translates into the civilian world. And um, very important, because branding, like my friend said, is very different in the military than what it looks like on the outside. So you need to investigate that, you need to research that and see exactly what's out there for you and make that, that transition as far as who you are and what your resume looks like. Um, and, and you need to have that you know, continually looking at it, changing it, uh, depending on what you're trying to achieve, you know, the, the degree you're trying to, to get, the job you're looking for, you know, I mean, the, the, the great thing about nowadays that it doesn't matter to the degree you have, because that degree can fit into so many different professions. It's just a matter of finding what you're good at, what fulfills you, and um, basically how you promote yourself and, and, and show people who you are. But the best thing I think for veterans in the transition is the discipline and the integrity that we bring into that civilian world. And that is not taught anywhere. That is huge. And anybody who gives you a job or employs you or, or contracts you, that is huge. And that should be, and then, the, then there's that diversity and inclusion and everything else. But that discipline and integrity are huge skill sets that, that you have above a lot of people. No, absolutely. I agree. There's definitely many things that uh, that I think veterans can offer to the civilian world as far as uh, 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 career wise. Absolutely. Um, so I just want to finish out with saying thank you so much um, for basically allowing me to pick your brain sure. um, in the rest of as well. And I want to also mention to everyone that uh, that um, there's so much information. There's so much more information about there uh, out there about you. Um, I was really so touched to see so many different things actually you're into. Like I saw that uh, the ballet folklorico of yeah. uh, uh, Buriken, right? And uh -huh. so uh, not only that, but there was like um, I saw something about some kind of production company and and a bunch of different things that uh, like you know you have your hands into. And I think that's so amazing that. Um, you're more than just, you know, it's just military. No, no, no. It's so much bigger than that. And uh, and I think that's really important, too, for veterans to really, like, kind of branch out into things that you really love. And so thank you so, so much for, for being with us and sharing your story with us. I, it definitely touched many people. And uh, and without further ado, I want to turn it over back over to Dennis, our uh, our host.
Thank you for having me, Jasmine. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jasmine. You did an amazing job. Uh, this is, wouldn't be possible without the support of the Queens College of Veterans Club. So thank you again. Olga, thank you so much. I'm so appreciative of your inspirational story. Once again, it's just hearing it, it never gets old for me. And as a of appreciation, we have a QC swag bag that will ensure that gets over to you. We have some <laughs> COVID items. We have, you know, face masks for you. So you're officially a member of the QC Veterans family. Thank you. So thank much. you. And customary, mm -hmm. we're working within uh, the actual veterans field and uh, military overall. We have a challenge coin for you as well. I'll make sure it gets over here. Thank you. Yes. So Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. No and 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 to all the veterans, you know, I mean, staying in school, getting a degree, I think it's the best thing you can do for yourself um, because it's 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 an open. Uh, field out there. I mean, you can kind of name name the game depending on how you present yourself. And 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 what you project is what they're going to see. So make sure that you like yourself and what you stand for and are before you go out there. So it'll it'll come through and you'll see it. So I I highly recommend that you you work on that. You know, doing interviews, talking to people, and then tell everybody and anybody who wants to listen, "Hey, I want to have a job in X, Y, and Z." Because you never know who you're talking to. You never know if they're the ones who are going to give you the opportunity. Okay. So, but thank, thank you. you so much for your time. Greatly appreciate it. If you enjoyed this event, please go to our Instagram or Facebook page and follow Queens College Veterans. Upcoming events like the November 10th Veterans Day Tribute event will be coming up. Please also uh, hit subscribe to the Current Student Life YouTube channel for future student life events. Last but not least, don't forget to rock the vote November 3rd. This marks the formal end to our event. Thank you so much and have a great night. Bye.